was the first president of PSMIT. Pins in 1939 and graduated among the first in his class. In the same year, he took the board, medical board examination and was the medical board top notcher. Dr. Elpedio Gamboa was a dedicated public servant. He was employed as an enteric disease specialist in public health research laboratories in San Lazaro Hospital from 1949 to 1954 and has been a consultant in infectious diseases in different public, ho different private and public hospitals. The Chinese General Hospital in Manila from 1952 to 1974, the Luna General Hospital from 1966 to 1974, the Veterans Memorial Hospital from 1966 to 1974, and the Manila Sanitarium, Pasay City from 1973 to 1974. He was also a multi-awarded uh, physician, among which he received the most distinguished professor from the Interns Organization Institute of Medicine at FEU Manila, in 1968, he was chosen as an outstanding professor also from the Institute of Medicine Student Council for Eastern University in 1959 and 1970. And he was uh, chosen as an outstanding medical educator abroad by the UP Medical Alumni Society in America in 1988. Um, his children donated the professor, the Dr. Elpidio El Gamboa profes Professorial Chair in Infectious Diseases through the University of the Philippines in Manila in January of 1989. So as an advocate of scientific inquiry, and continuous learning. Today, we honor him in this 20th Elpidio Gaboa Memorial Lecture. And to introduce our uh, lecturer is uh, our president, Dr. Mario Panaligan. Thank you, Dr. Andres Reyes. Um, we are definitely fortunate, of course, to have a renowned doctor, public health uh, person, um, to speak no, for the 28th Elpidio Gamboa Memorial Lecture. Um, Dr. Susan Pineda Mercado is a special envoy of the President for Global Health Initiatives, Office of the President of the Philippines. She is the lead of the Philippine National Red Cross Institute for Public Health Emergencies, uh, Philippine Red Cross, and the President of Neuron Center for Leadership and Communication for Asia and the Pacific to talk on social-cultural dimensions of public health issues, new directions and perspectives. May I now call on Dr. Susan Pineda Mercado. Thank you, Dr. Panaligan, and thank you for this uh, invitation. It is indeed an honor to be here um, to speak about uh, social cultural dimensions of public health issues, directions, and perspectives. Um, let me just uh, start. Okay, how do I do this? Okay, um, let me just start by saying that. Um, when we talk about social cultural dimensions, uh, these are reflected in how human beings interact with the physical environment. And I didn't want to sort of pull out social and cultural determinants from the physical determinants of health because the environment is shaped by how people interact with nature and how they interact with the earth. And how we, what we've done to our environment 
impacts on our behavior and that also impacts on health. So let me just try to understand how this works. I press passing, clicking where? I didn't click anything. Are you clicking for me? Okay, please click back. <laughs> Sorry. Can you please teach me how to do this? How do we go back? Uh, okay, can we go back one slide? I think it's not working. Okay, it's always useful to start with a uh, photograph of the Earth and for us to situate ourselves in the reality of a finite planet. Um, sometimes we go about our work and we're doing work uh, in, in, a very limited, in a very limited space or with a very limited perspective, but nowadays in public health, we cannot think or talk about um, public health without thinking about health of the planet. And next slide, please. I think I'm going to talk about a few uh, demographic trends that are impacting on the health of people and definitely urbanization is one of those. Uh, people are beginning to live more in cities, more than half of all people live in cities and that's not a bad thing, it's a good thing because in cities and urban areas you can focus or concentrate resources like water, electricity, food and so on. But the, the rate of growth of cities, if it is not managed properly, could have very negative effects on health. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is just a very simple, uh, a very simple portrayal of the trends in urbanization in the world. And you'll see the blue line represents the developed countries, and the orange line represents the less developed countries. And what we know is that in most of the developed countries, a saturation point has been reached. Many of these countries will no longer have more urbanization and therefore more growth of cities is seen in the developing countries and that includes countries like the Philippines. Now, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, now, it's not just the growth of cities, but it's also the speed of the growth of cities. So this slide just shows you how long it takes for a city to grow from 1 million people to 8 million people. And it took London 130 years to move from 1 million to 8 million. It took Bangkok 45 years, it took Dhaka 37 years, and it took Seoul 25 years. So what is this saying to us? That the, the urbanization is rapid. Unlike before where it took you know, a lot of time, nowadays uh, countries are even constructing cities, planning and creating cities. So the speed of change is uh, phenomenal and that has an impact on society and on culture. Next slide, please. Now, when urbanization is rapid and unplanned, this is where we develop inequity. Because what happens is people are gra gravitate towards the city and as they gravitate towards the city, they begin to live in areas without water, without sanitation, without shelter, without electricity, and they are hoping for employment but are not able to get that employment. So many, many years ago, people would come to the slum and would move from the slum into the city. So gumaganda yung buhay nila. But nowadays, you see people living in the slum and staying in slums and informal settlements for generations. So their children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren are living in the same peri-urban informal settlements where, which, which are natural breeding grounds for, grounds for infection and poor health. Next slide, please. Now, I would be remiss if I don't speak about the increase in surface temperature of the Earth. Uh, we know from the UN conference on climate, uh, climate change that one of the big challenges of this generation is to see to it that the surface temperature of the Earth does not increase by more than 1.5 degrees centigrade by the year 2030. And this just shows you over time from the year 1880 up to the year 2010 how surface temperature on Earth has been increasing. So the warming of the planet, global warming, has multiple effects.
not just on human beings, but on animals, insects, and the way the entire physical Earth is configured. Next slide, please. So this is from Beijing in July, where temperatures hit 40. And I know you're familiar with the California wildfires, which up to recently, when it started to rain, uh, affected about 200, 250,000 people. These fires kept on burning and would not stop. Uh, when we had these heat waves in China, in Japan, in Germany, in Greece, the mortality rates among the aging started to go up. So this is a current problem. It is not a future issue. It is a current concern that affects everything that we do in health. Next slide, please. And if things were to continue as they are, temperatures could spike by as much as four degrees centigrade. In that kind of a scenario, uh, only reptiles would be able to survive. Now, my husband, who is a, used to be an elected political official, said, well, I would survive a four-degree uh, increase in centigrade. But for, you know, so for gen in general, for the warm-blooded mammals, we cannot survive an increase in surface temperature by four degrees. So we're talking now about survival. Next slide, please. So as a consequence, the Earth itself is a changing planet. We're, we think we can change things, but we cannot anymore. We can try to mitigate. That's why the word mitigate has been used now by the UNCCC. We can try to slow it down. We can try to adapt. But things are happening in the environment that are already beyond our control. Let's go to the next slide, please. So extreme heat and drought. This has impacts on water. It has impacts on food production. And it has impacts on the ecological system of farming and forest areas. Next slide, please. The melting of the icebergs. You've seen so many dramatic, uh, so many dramatic movies and documentaries about this, but it is true. And uh, I was at a conference last week on climate change here at SMX. And I don't know if you know that movie, The Day After Tomorrow. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. It's it's an old movie, but. If the uh, temperature of the sea continues to drop, the, the sea becomes colder, then we are heading towards an ice age. And it could be an abrupt change in the way uh, life, life would be on Earth as we know it now. Next slide, please. So with the melting of the icebergs, we're also seeing storm surges, tsunamis, floods. Next slide, please. And we're seeing flooding in areas that have never flooded. Um, we're even seeing floods in Mindanao. It used to be that there were never floods in Mindanao, but nowadays in the Philippines, there, is flood, there are floods in Mindanao. <coughs> this is from Western Japan, which does not flood also, and recently went underwater. Uh, in the 1990s, Under Secretary Celso Roque, who passed away uh, a decade ago or so, said, in the 1990s, that when it rains in Metro Manila, it's going to flood 50 years from now. So I said to him, I don't believe you. That was in the 1990s. And nowadays, we know that when we have rain, it is highly likely that there will be flooding. And with flooding, recently we had an outbreak of leptospirosis. Next slide, please. Now, because the world is becoming more urban, when disasters hit an urban area, more people are affected. More people are affected because more people live in urban areas. But the disasters are now more complex because it's not just about water rising. It's also about uncollected garbage. It's also about water pipes that now go underwater and are, uh, if they have leaks, will contaminate clean sources of water plus all kinds of issues that come with uh, densely populated urban areas. Next slide, please. Now, let's shift a little bit because I'll just have to go very quickly into some of these issues. Currently, 70% of households in developing countries, and in the Philippines, it's estimated to be 50%. 50% of households are still burning wood for cooking fuel. And this is a direct, a direct hazard to health for people who live in, uh, this, who stay in the home for 24 hours. So mothers, babies, older persons, etc. Next slide, please. In some places, women and girls are still collecting 
water to carry up to 50% of water of the household. And in the urban areas of Metro Manila, uh, we know that girls oftentimes are late for school or do not go to school because they have to wait and fetch water for the family. So this is a gender issue, it's cultural, it's social, but it is also about the physical environment. Next slide, please. More than 7 million deaths occur every year and air pollution has been directly linked to cardiovascular disease. We used to think before that when we talk about air pollution, poor air quality, the impacts we're looking at are related to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or, uh, or um, asthma or other respiratory illnesses, but now the linkage to cognitive dysfunction and to cardiovascular disease has been made very clear. And it is estimated that 90% of the world's population breathes sick air. Now, think about Metro Manila, think about what you go through in traffic. Even if you're in a car with closed windows, you are inhaling contaminated air. Next slide, please. Now, the degradation of green space, congested living conditions, increase the proximity of human beings to animals and insects. So as the animals and insects lose their habitat, they move closer to human beings. Next slide, please. Next slide there. So in the case of the Aedes aegypti uh, mosquito, which used to be found mainly in tropical areas, it is now increasingly seen in non-tropical areas. So in uh, northern Japan, for example, that never had dengue outbreaks, they're now seeing cases of dengue. So something is happening to the mosquitoes with the changes in the climate. And we don't know also what's happening to other insects or other forms of life or other vectors that could be carrying disease. Next slide, please. Now, we know, and I shouldn't lecture this to an infectious group because this is your bread and butter, right? But as human beings live close, closer to animals, then there you have greater risk for uh, viral, the leaping of viral species from one, from one, uh, one species to another. Next slide, please. And certainly, uh, we, are, we have not been exempt from avian influenza. Let's go to the next slide, please. We were also affected by SARS, which was carried by the civet cat that was found mainly in China. Next slide, please. And Ebola, although recently we have not been affected, affected there's been increasing difficulty in controlling uh, Ebola in Africa. Next slide, please. And airplanes, so going to the social and cultural determinants, airplanes become a perfect international winged vector of disease. So the spread of diseases across the world in places where we don't have domestic vectors is because the human being could become a carrier and could travel from one place to another. Next slide, please. Now, I'll have to talk also about road injuries. We don't use the word accidents anymore because we talk about car crashes, we talk about road injuries, and we talk about trauma because with your increasing urbanization, you have increasing use of cars, dependence on motor vehicles, and increasing risk for injuries that come from road uh, from road injuries and from car crashes. And uh, this is from Vietnam, I think, but this could be a scene uh, in Dumaguete, for example, where recently I was there and I said, my goodness, it's so noisy. There are so many motorcycles. This is unregulated use of certain types of vehicular uh, vehicles that have impacts on health that we are not really studying. Next slide, please. Now, we also create new opportunities for work and income, but in many instances, occupational health uh, regulations are not followed, and therefore workers, while they have more income, do develop ergonomic stress and have poor health and increasing incidence of hypertension and diabetes among the working populations who are working in factories because of the conditions where they work. Next slide, please. Now, I would also be remiss without talking about CBRN, what we call chemical, biological, radiation, and nuclear events that are uh, happening all over the world and could happen in the Philippines. So this is a chemical explosion from Tianjin, China in 2015. 
that released 800 tons of ammonium nitrate caused 173 deaths. And a second explosion, which was worse, that happened 30 seconds later. Now, you can't really see it, but the, um, if you can see that red little space there, that's where the explosion took place. And then you see the effect on metal. So many, so many, many, many uh, uh, meters away, then you can effect. You can imagine the effect on human beings. And we ask the question: If something like this were to happen in the Philippines, how prepared are we to respond to a chemical explosion, for example? Next slide, please. And for this Changjin explosion, it lasted for several days. So. Uh, these are new public health challenges for us, and there is a really a need for us to improve our capability to respond and to contain and to mitigate whatever happens if there is a chemi chemical explosion, particularly since we do have industrial sites. Next slide, please. All right, of course, uh, bombings and um, ex the use of explosions is becoming a huge risk in all cities all over the world. So we cannot close our eyes to terrorism and say that, oh, well, it doesn't happen in Metro Manila. Well, it happened in Davao in 2016, which was the bombing of a night market. And again, we ask the question, how prepared are we for mass casualty incidents as a public health concern? Next slide, please. This is from Santiago de Compostela in Spain in 2017, where 13 cars of a train were overturned, 78 dead, 143 of the 20, 218 passengers were injured. And we are using trains, but what happens when one of them becomes derailed? So this is part of the social, cultural, political, and geographic context of human beings and Filipinos in the world today, and we need to be prepared for things like this. Next slide, please. Now, I never thought in my life that I would have to talk about nuclear explosion. But given the uh, political scenario in the world today, I think it's, it's, not too, it's never too early to think about what would happen if somebody pulled the trigger somewhere and we had to deal with uh, radiation and nuclear fallout. So let's go to the next slide, please. And um, this is from 2017 when a uh, missile was tested that entered the airspace of Japan from North Korea. And from that point on, Japan started doing drills for um, a nuclear fallout. Here you will see uh, adults who are crouching because you, you need to sort of protect, you know, keep the hair. It's the hair that gets the radiation. No? And next slide, please. So they have this uh, sort of head protection for children, and towels to cover the eyes. And when you're supposed to crouch down, you're supposed to cover your arms. Because if you look at the pictures of World War II in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you would see that nalalapnos uh, yung extremities. It's the flesh of the arms that, that would get affected, even many, many miles away from where the blast occurs. So should we be preparing for it? Uh, not to the extent that we should be preparing for an earthquake, maybe, but we should be thinking about it and knowing what to do if ever, if ever something happens. Next slide, please. Now, I'll need to talk about uh, non-communicable disease. That's my area of work. And this is just to show you the leading causes of mortality in the Western Pacific region. Uh, and you'll see from the ages of zero to 70, the major cause of death is already non-communicable disease. And we knew that a long time ago. But there are connections between infectious disease and non-communicable disease. So in the case of acute glomerulonephritis and end-stage renal disease, although nowadays end-stage renal disease is caused by diabetes, or when we think about uh, rheumatic heart disease and infections or cervical cancer, there is a connection between infection and non-communicable conditions. But I wanted to show you a smaller version of the slide. Let's go to the next slide, please. And this is the ages of zero to 25. So I did a sort of zoom in to the younger age group. And what we're seeing is that infectious and parasitic diseases are becoming less of a leading cause of mortality in that age group. And you're actually seeing more 
mortality from non-communicable diseases and injuries. So again, the changing conditions and contexts of young people is changing the demographic profile in the region. This is the region. Next slide, please. Now, what are the risk factors? Children's, children can recognize hundreds of brands. I have a four-year-old grandson whose father is a car enthusiast, and he'll tell you if it's a Toyota or a Hyundai or whatever it is, he knows. But you ask children to, to name 20 trees or to identify 20 trees or 20 plants. They can't do it anymore. So the younger generation is growing up very detached from the natural environment. Next slide, please. Of course, we are in an environment with calorie-rich and nutrient-poor food. Next slide, please. And you must have seen this slide, but obesity and overweight is one of the biggest, literally biggest, risk factors that we are facing today. Well, the Philippines, we've got malnutrition, overnutrition, but in some countries like the United States, up to 60% of, of the population are obese and overweight. So you're really looking at a huge, huge epidemic of non-communicable disease. Next slide, please. So sugar intake, next slide, please. Smoking, next slide, please. Uh, alcoholic beverage and, and the abuse of alcohol, especially among young people, next slide, please. And of course, we are living in a highly digitalized world with so many things connecting us. Next slide, please. Two billion people are active on social media globally with the Western Pacific having a billion internet users and in the Philippines, mobile phones were stuck to them. So this is the new world where we live. Young people are doing their social activity on gadgets. Next slide, please. Now, I would also be remiss if I don't talk about mental health. Globally, over 300 million people are living with depression. What does that mean? I mean, think about the Philippines has 100 million people, three times that population is the number of people with depression. It's a huge problem even in the Philippines. Next slide, please. And uh, that, that results, if unchecked, results in suicides. And again, in the Western Pacific region, there are about 500 suicides every day. And it's the second leading cause of death in the age group of 15 to 29-year-old people. Next slide, please. So for everyone, it's difficult to keep up with the speed of change in the world, whether that's in the physical environment, the social environment, the cultural environment. And those are all interconnected. I think that's my main message. Next slide, please. So in this last few minutes, I just wanted to talk about certain directions and perspectives for public health. Next slide, please. And... Um, I think working at the level of the city or working locally is very important. We like to think about doing national things. I was just listening to the work on mass immunization. We should be thinking about the ability to do things in localities because it's easier to manage, but these are now huge populations we're talking about instead of thinking about it always in a national context. So working with cities, planting trees, next slide please, Planting trees even in urban areas and having fresh air corridors because we are all exposed to very poor quality air. Next slide, please. Resilient healthcare systems. Uh, next slide, please. We've been doing some work with local architects on what kind of material should be used for housing. And in, in the context of extreme heat, you want light housing material. You want housing material that will withstand storms or wind or floods, but you also want materials that repel the heat. Next slide, please. And this is an evacuation center where they put the kitchen separately from where the people are evacuated. If you watch what happens in evacuation centers, people are cooking beside their bed. So they're inhaling everything in, in the disaster zone, no? in the, where they're displaced. So this one also has a tilapia, you see that little oval inside, has a tilapia pond at the bottom. So that if people are displaced, there's fish there that can be harvested and people will not have to be eating a lot of processed food like noodles or sardines that are very high in sodium content. Next slide, please. So these are designs 
of green healthcare centers that can harvest rainwater. If we are experiencing the drought, then we should be uh, collecting rain. We have a lot of water, we have a lot of rain and we're wasting it. So working with architects, I think public health and the health sector, working with architects, with engineers, to resolve some of these issues on climate is very important. Next slide, please. Greening of urban neighborhoods. So all over the world, people are beginning to plant in their cities and create uh, ways of cooling the cities, reducing the carbon dioxide in the air, and of course, producing food that could be, uh, that could be beneficial to the families. Next slide, please. Family approaches to health. Whether we're talking about tuberculosis or diabetes, when you have one patient, your family is in fact the entire patient. But we are still looking at individuals one at a time. I think it is high time for us to start thinking about risks of families and addressing the treatment of families regardless of whether we are looking at infectious or non-communicable conditions. Next slide, please. Um, I'll go through this really quickly, but we need to do more regulation on harmful products. This is an example of plain packaging in Australia, where on cigarettes you can't see any more brands. That's the next step for the Philippines. Next slide, please. Regulation of alcohol. We have underestimated this problem. The Global School Health Survey is showing that children are drinking at the age of 13, 14, 15. Where are they drinking? They're buying alcohol at the 24-hour convenience stores. You look outside at night, and you'll see young people gathering, drinking. There is a law that you cannot sell alcohol to children below the age of 18, but guess what? Children are reporting that they're drinking at the age of 13 and 14. Next slide, please. In Europe, there have been efforts to control advertising to children. And this is because all of these ads for junk food, unhealthy food, enters the consciousness of young children and they say, mommy, I want that one because they see the toy. And mom is so harassed, okay, she'll buy it. But she actually would not want to buy that for her child. So uh, regulations on advertising is something we could consider. Next slide, please. This is representing the hygiene charter of Hong Kong when they had an outbreak of SARS. They had a multi-sectoral agreement to promote Sneezing into your sleeve, washing hands, uh, not coughing in public, and so on. No? So it's a multi-sectoral thing, and I think in health, we really have to develop ways of working across all sectors if we want to control infections. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. In Malaysia, they have an initiative for culture and health where they use uh, cultural practices to promote Health. So where they have festivals or they have gatherings. That's the time when they deliver health messages. Next slide, please. And of course, integrating in our maternal and child health program the issues of obesity, diabetes, and of course, promoting breastfeeding instead of the use of infant formula, which has been linked to the increased risk for adult diabetes. Next slide, please. So just to summarize all of it, um, when we talk about the social cultural dimensions, I think we want to talk about threats to planetary health from human behavior that has created the change in climate and a changing planet. Our unhealthy behaviors that are related to intake of processed food, the accessibility of harmful products like tobacco, electronic cigarettes, alcohol, and the loss of social capital. As people move into cities, the traditions are no longer there and people are isolated and then they, they become depressed, they turn to, uh, to drugs, and so on. And then, of course, the digitalization of life, our 24-7 connectivity, whether it's through social media or uh, other media platforms, and the stress of living in cities and being just so busy doing everything, not having time to interact with nature. So directions and new perspectives include planetary health, urban health focuses, injury prevention, a strong focus on mental health and well-being, non-communicable disease prevention and control, family approaches to all diseases, promoting health, working in settings like cities, schools, islands, communities, the regulation of harmful products, and the regulation of exposure to advertising. 
and strategic communication for health. So I hope through this brief presentation, I've been able to give you uh, some kind of an overview of what the social cultural dimensions of health look like and uh, ideas about how we could move forward to improve the health of our people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mercado. So, uh, we'd like to award you this plaque of appreciation to Dr. Susan Pineda Mercado uh, on the, the 20th Dr. Elpidio Gamboa Memorial Lecturer on the occasion of the 40th Peace Meet Annual Convention entitled Ruby 4D Rambling Boundless Yearning in for ID. Given this 29th day of November at the SMX Convention Center, Moa Complex, Pasay City. Signed, um, Dr. Minette Rosario, Chair of the Scientific Committee, Dr. Marisa Alejandria, Overall Chair, and Dr. Mario Panaligan, President of PSMID.
for those who want their pictures taken, we have a photo booth at Function Room 2. So you can have all your remembrance for this convention. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Time check, it's 10.39. Welcome to Convention Symposium 2, Infections in Special Hosts. I am Feliz Garingala Molina, chairperson of this session. With me as co-chair is Dr. Jeanette Omali, who will introduce our three speakers. Infectious diseases is very exciting and challenging field, and undeniably, very broad in scope. In our individual patients, we do not deal with a single organ system, since infections can occur anywhere from head to foot. Host factors such as genetics, innate host immune defenses, age, and underlying non-infectious disease conditions create important impact on the likelihood of an infectious process to occur, response to treatment, as well as prognosis. This session will focus on three special populations, namely the elderly, the critically ill, and the diabetic. The main objective is to discuss the pathophysiology of aging and diabetes, as well as the role of microbiota in critically ill as these relate to occurrence of infection and the clinical implications of such relationship. Good morning, everyone. Today we will have three distinguished doctors to present. And in the interest of time, we ask that you hold your questions until all speakers have finished their presentation. You may also submit your questions through the Mecca app. The username is your email, and the password is PSMID18. So we proceed with our first speaker. She is a professor of the UP College of Medicine and a director in the Institute on Aging, NIH UP Manila, as well as the Vice President of the Philippine Foundation for Vaccination. Let us all welcome Dr. Shelly Ann De La Vega. Good morning, everyone. I again thank the organizers and scientific committee of uh, this PISMID uh, convention for including the topic of senescence because all of us are aging. But uh, for the topic today, we are going beyond immunosenescence. 
And as mentioned by uh, Dr. Pineda Mercado a while ago, there are many factors beyond the immune system that affect uh, the response of older persons to infections. So let's uh, start now with... Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. All right, so the objectives of this talk is to first recognize that the Philippines is aging. That is one very important factor that we need to consider in planning our programs and policies, no? not just for older persons, but many aspects such as aging, infections, vaccination, for example. Now, I'd also like to compare aging versus senescence because these are two related but different um, terms no? that we need to understand. And then go to immunosenescence, which many of you are probably familiar with. Beyond the immune system, of course, are many challenges that affects the older person's response to infections. And then we will discuss the clinical implications of these changes to s particularly three, no? three disease conditions uh, and one program um, concern, which is vaccination. Okay, so the population is getting older, no? If you look here, we are now about 77% old. So there are 7 million older persons in the Philippines, but yeah, but uh, in a few years, no? particularly in 2050, we will be practically uh, almost 30% old. All right, so based on the 2015 census of populations, uh, from 7.5 million 60-year-olds, by about uh, 2030 or 2035, that number would have doubled to 14%. So looking here now, we need to prepare for that uh, eventuality when the Philippines will now be like Japan, like Japan is now. Now we are slowly aging, but according to our friends in the Population Commission, the Philippines is now entering that phase of uh, slower growth in the number of infants being born. So we are now in the low fertility rate, no? But we're still, we're still being replaced. The older persons are still being replaced. We still have a lot of women giving birth to children. If you look here at the Philippines' leading causes of death, we know that Non-communicable diseases now constitute most of the top 10, but looking at that list, pneumonia, infections such as influenza, and probably even COPD are definitely related to infectious diseases. All right, so how do we define aging? So aging is the accumulation of changes responsible for the sequential alterations that accompany advancing age and the associated progressive increase in the chance of disease and death. In contrast, senescence is something that happens with aging that predisposes us to increasing incidence of death. We age through various uh, ways. from complex interactions of genetics and environmental factors, from uh, genetic control uh, issues, accumulation of damages by free radicals, cross linkages of macromolecules, and somatic mutation. So senescence is that phase in the lifespan which is associated with an increased probability of dying as a function of time, no? So we do not, uh, we do not die because of senescence. All mammals senesce because that is intrinsic and inevitable to us. Only worms probably will not die and some drosophila flies will not senesce. 
but definitely mammals will also nest. So when you hear the word senile, it really is that phase in the aging process that is now associated with dying, okay. Now there are some principles of aging that I'd like to discuss with you. One is that some physiologic changes alter the appearance of disease. So that the symptomatology of pneumonia may be different no, for older persons. Instead of having fever, they may just present with anorexia. No? Instead of shortness of breath, they may just feel dizzy. So there are many symptoms that are not necessarily as we learned it in school for sepsis or pneumonia. Now one other physiological uh, principle is that loss of function may not be apparent until the body is subjected to stress. So you may feel young now, but once you get a cold or a bad infection such as pneumonia, then that is when you will feel really old. And we now know that more older persons are really respond differently to pneumonia, even if they are given antibiotics. Now, one good principle that I'd like you to remember from this lecture is aging is a very heterogeneous experience. No? The older we are, the more unlike each other we become. And there is no one description of one, what an old person is. For example, we have young olds who are between the ages of 60 to 75. Young olds are generally healthy, vigorous, active, and vital. Many of you who are in this, is in this room are probably in that age group. And then, of course, we move on to the middle old or the old old, which are between the ages of 75 to 85. And that's when they become, to, they become frail, more frail, more sickly, more prone to complications of diseases such as pneumonia and when they become dependent on others in their activities of daily living. This is the group that we need to focus on. And of course, the oldest old, about the age of 85, are mostly frail and dependent. It's very rare that we see someone who is still very active. But I do see patients such as uh, this 90-year-old uh, patient of mine who came to my clinic asking me to help him to become vital again. So there are a few of them like that. All right, let's go to organ-specific aging. 